Hello, this is a presentation about the Aymara language. I'll cover general themes surrounding Aymara, such as linguistic features, related languages, and its historical linguistic position. Aymara is part of the Aymara language family. It has 29 phonemes, which can be seen to the left. Of these phonemes, there are 26 consonants and three vowels, and it has a subject-object verb system. Aymara is spoken by around 2 million people, namely the Aymara people. It is spoken in around a third of Bolivia, as well as parts of southern Peru and northern Chile. Based on both toponyms and the location of surviving Aymara languages, the language appears to have originated around the coast located in the Peruvian provinces of Kenet and Nazca. The proto language appears to have rapidly spread southwards, covering most of the Bolivian highlands by the 1500s. The earliest recording of Aymara can be found in a document that was published in Lima, Peru in 1584. There are currently three languages within the Aymaran family tree. These are Aymara, Jacare, and Kaki. There are likely also several extinct languages within the family. This can be inferred from the names of various places in the surrounding area, as well as mentions of other languages in historical sources. These languages would have covered a wider area of southern and central Peru. Both Jakar and Kaki are spoken largely in single villages. Jakar is spoken in a village called Tupe, as well as nearby areas within its department of Yayos in Lima, Peru. Jakar has around a thousand speakers, and Jakar and Aymara appear to have diverged from their proto language around the year 480, as can be inferred from chronological calculations. Pictured here is an outline of the Jakar phonemic system, showcasing its 39 segmental phonemes, also shared with Kaki. Of these, there are 36 consonants and 24 voiceless stops, nine more voiceless stops than Aymara. Kaki, on the other hand, is spoken in a nearby village called Kaki. There are only a few elderly speakers and is widely regarded as either being close to extinction or already extinct, particularly as it is not being continued by the younger generation. There's also a debate around whether or not it can be considered as its own unique language or whether it's only dialectically different from Jakaru. It is believed to split from Aymara around the year 840. Jakar and Kaki are more alike than they are with Aymara, though Kaki is more similar to Aymara than Jakar is. As for similarities across all three languages, one way in which they're similar is that none of the languages have phonemic stress, and the stress in each language can be found on the second last syllable in a word. Additionally, all three languages distinguish between both pharyngeal and velar voiceless fricatives, as well as plain, aspirated, and glottalized affricates. As for the differences between the languages, one example of a difference is that the vowel length is much more important in Aymara than in either Jakar or Kaki. While the latter two languages use vowel length only for the first syllable of a root, it is grammatically important for Aymara. Grammatical functions on the first person future morpheme fully rely on vowel length. Furthermore, Aymara has a class of independent suffixes that affect word structure, which are not found at all in Jakar or Kaki. Aymara is also missing velar and alveolar nasals along with alveolar and palatal sibilants, which are found in Jakar and Kaki. Finally, Aymara does not have three non-sonorant consonant series that the others have, namely alveopalatal stops and alveolar and retroflex affricates. Due to the three extra consonant series in Jakar, cognates between Aymara and Jakar can be used to identify where Aymara consonants originated from. proto Aymara was likely similar to Jakar in particular regard to the phonology, with this in mind, these three consonants can be looked at in further detail as they have somehow disappeared in modern Aymara. Upon looking at these consonants in the cognates between Jakar and Aymara, they appear to correlate to T and Ch in modern Aymara, with the possible proto-language sources visible below. Moving on to structure, the structure for Aymara is fairly straightforward. Roots are nearly all bisyllabic, while most suffixes are monosyllabic. Roots tend to be consonant vowel, optional consonant, consonant vowel, but may also replace those first two options with a lone vowel. Suffixes, on the other hand, are mostly consonant vowel, with various exceptions as listed, vowel consonant vowel being the least common. Aymara has a trivocalic vowel system, meaning there are three vowels, as mentioned at the start. This consists of one low vowel, A, and two high vowels, I and U. These two high vowels may be lowered by a feature known as the uvular effect. This causes them to lower to E and O respectively when next to uvular consonants. 
Looking back to proto Aymara, it appears to have had a contrastive velar nasal sound. This sound can still be found in Jakara, as well as some Aymara dialects on the borders of Bolivia, Peru and Chile, around the area where the language is believed to have originated. Therefore, this sound may have originated around the time the proto language emerged. In dialects, it can be found in cases such as the noun roots, Amhanu, Cheek, and Panara Grinder, in the Tirada dialect in Peru. One interesting feature of Amara is that speakers consider the past to be in front of them and the future to be behind them. This is obviously unlike the expectation in most languages, including English, that the future is ahead and the past is behind. Eckhart has attempted to explain the development of this unique feature through the process of concept priming, particularly diachronic priming. According to this hypothesis, diachronic priming results from inadvertently activating a concept when using one expression to describe another concept for which there is no current term over a long period of time, eventually leading this expression to be associated with the inadvertently activated concept. As the conceptualization of future being behind and the past being ahead is so rare, Eckhart highlights that the same processes driving the future ahead metaphor in most languages likely also played a driving role in Aymara before being actively changed within the language due to this diachronic priming, labeling this as a likely case of language change. As for specific situations in Aymara history, which may have primed such an unusual metaphor, Eckhart draws attention to two in particular, these being facing downstream in a river and traveling backwards. These scenarios may be specific to Aymara culture, such as cultural practices that involve facing in the direction of the water is flowing, or horse-drawn wooden sledges that require the rider to face backwards. This unusual metaphor may have then been cemented through being continuously primed over many years. Lexically driven vowel deletion, also referred to as vowel elision within the literature, is an important aspect of phonology in Aymara. This phenomenon can be seen in the example. When a suffix is added to a word, it deletes the vowel at the end of the word, as can be seen in the case of apa changing into ap once the suffix naka is added to it, as well as ka changing to k when the suffix ka is tagged on. The process of deleting vowels can result in consonant clusters of as many as six consonants in a row. Kim believes that this vowel elision may have originally served a phonological function and was then later uniformly lexicalized as a grammatical function of suffixes. There appears to be a dominance effect of lexically driven vowel deletion, in which some suffixes delete vowels while others do not. A dominant suffix is one which deletes the final vowel of the base word, while recessive suffixes do not delete a vowel. Again, this can be seen in the example on screen, with the green examples displaying dominant suffixes, while the red examples show recessive suffix behaviour. I will note that the previous slide only showed the examples in green. This then raises the question of what led to this effect. One thing to take note of is that Aymara is known to devoice vowels. This mainly occurs in two contexts, one being when the vowel is between voiceless consonants, and another being when it is positioned after a voiceless consonant at the end of a sentence. Due to this devoicing, people may assume the vowel has been deleted and thus adopt this perceived vowel deletion into the language over time. There is evidence for the variation in whether a vowel is deleted or not in the oldest historical sources of Aymara, as early as the 1600s. The rules for vowel elision are not outlined, but this is clearly a long-running linguistic feature, allowing sufficient time for people to reanalyze it. The way this may have happened can be seen in this hypothetical example. Eventually, the vowel elision may have been reanalyzed as a lexical rule rather than a phonological process, being falsely attributed to the suffixes which appear to drive it. As for the dominance effect itself, this may simply be due to viewing the suffixes through their respective morphosyntactic categories and using them as seen appropriate with this in mind. Regarding Aymara's relationship to other languages, it is unrelated to nearly all surrounding, and obviously far away, languages. This can largely be put down to its remote location in the mountainous region of the Middle Andes. That being said, Aymara is commonly associated with and compared to Quechua, a neighbouring Andean language. Quechua is much bigger than Aymara, with over 7 million speakers and spoken across various Latin American countries. However, despite their common association, there are no genetic links between the two languages and they are in different families. This does not mean that there have not been attempts to link the two. There are many linguistic similarities between the two languages that are not also found in the other local languages. Despite this, it is hard to ignore the vast and clear evidence of close language contact and years of intense borrowing between the languages. 
When loanwords are ignored, the languages fail to have sufficient evidence to genetically link them. If any links could be made, they would span too far back to realistically compare them, particularly as at that specific point, you would have to bring other obviously not related languages into the equation. From a historical perspective, the reconstructed phoneme systems for Proto-Aymarin and Proto-Ketchum are almost completely alike. The only outstanding difference is that Proto-Aymarin distinguished between plain, aspirated, and glottalized or ejective stops and affricates. This is also the case in modern-day Aymara, as mentioned previously. The most distinguishing feature between Proto-Aymarin and Proto-Ketchum is their morphophonology and phonotactics, notably the aforementioned lexically driven vowel deletion. Furthermore, in Aymara, nouns and suffixes must end with vowels, whereas this is not necessarily the case in Quechuan. Assuming that this is also the case in their proto-languages, there is visible evidence of which words in Aymara are loanwords, based on whether a vowel has been tagged onto a word ending in a consonant. The majority of the loanwords in Aymara were borrowed from either Quechua or Andean Spanish. Words have been borrowed into Aymara for centuries, with most being borrowed so long ago that they are now considered to be native to Aymara. Shown here are examples of loanwords that originally came from archaic Spanish or Castilian. They are so old that they predate language change and preserve a variation of the archaic forms of words such as donkey. One dialect in Aymara that is particularly interesting regarding loanwords is Molac Aymara from the region of Molac in the highlands of Peru. This has much more loanwords than other Aymara dialects, particularly cultural borrowings. As mentioned, many loanwords in Aymara come from the local Andean Spanish. This Spanish was first introduced by Spanish missionaries who came to the Andes around the end of the 16th century, meaning many of the loanwords have roots in religion. Apart from words directly related to religion, even things such as greetings have religious relations, despite the loss of the religious connotation over many years. A greeting unique to the Monarch region originates from the phrase Puris Mary, with the response originating from the phrase without sin. These words are so far removed from their origins that, like the other loanwords, they are now viewed as native Amara greetings. Monarch Amara speakers also most commonly use Chusulupaj for thank you, coming from the phrase may God bless you. While many words are directly borrowed with their meanings intact, some have their meanings reinterpreted or expanded on. For instance, the word mira was originally borrowed from a word meaning look and is now used as please in Malayak Amara. Another word originating from key has been expanded on to also mean shut or lock in a verbal way. This is mainly done through verbal suffixes, such as adding a derivational verbal reverser suffix to make the phrase leave it open. Notable calques within the language also include full noun phrases such as potable water. As for Quechua loanwords in Aymara, 15 to 30 percent of the lexicon is shared, while the remaining percentage is clearly not shared. Furthermore, loanwords mainly comprise of non-basic words, while basic words are more native. For instance, the words for the numbers 1 and 2 do not appear to be cognates, while later numbers do. Examples of words shared across Aymara and Cusco Quechua, as well as their proto languages where possible, can be seen below. The word behind is an example of a word that was likely loaned from Quechua. Notably, Proto Aymaran and Proto Quechuan have nearly fully identical shared items in their lexicons, indicating that they formed into their respective families around the time of close contact between their pre proto languages. And examples can be seen below. Pre Proto Aymara describes the part of Aymara's history right before it was solidified into the language of Proto Aymara. It was mostly phonologically similar to Proto Aymara, with the same three vowels, voiceless stops at the labial, alveolar, velar, and uvular places of articulation, and voiceless alveopalatal and retroflex affricates. Evidence from Pre Proto Aymara can be looked at in an attempt to find a time before the profound effects of language contact between Aymara and Quechua took place. In his paper, Emlyn attempted to obtain a glimpse of what Aymara may have been like before heavy borrowing from Quechua. Around a third of the central Aymara lexicon comes from Proto-Aymara, while a quarter is borrowed from Quechua languages in the area. From looking at pre-Proto-Aymara, Emlyn observed that over a third of Proto-Aymara's lexicon may come from pre-Proto-Quechua. There is also influence in the other direction, with Quechua's morphous syntax appearing to have been significantly remodelled based on Aymara. The influence of Quechua on Aymara may explain some differences between pre-Proto-Aymara and Proto-Aymara. However, more differences can be seen in terms of the consonants. For instance, pre-Proto-Aymara does not have Y or W at the beginning of roots, 
despite there being many such roots in proto amaran and modern Aymara. This can be attributed to borrowing from Quechua, as all cases of proto amaran roots beginning with Y and W are shared with proto quechuan and appear to originate from pre proto quechuan as seen below. Other patterns that are revealed by removing words that likely originate from Quechua include nearly a quarter of pre proto amaran roots starting with a vowel, and roughly another 17% starting with H, a voiceless glottal fricative. Examples can be seen below. Emlyn points out a complementary distribution of these consonants where H mainly appears at the start of roots and W and Y appear often but never at the start of roots. Based on these observations, there appears to have been a consonant merger at some point in pre proto amara Further evidence supporting such a consonant merger includes inconsistent attestations of some modern Aymara words showing variations between being written with an initial H or initial Y or W. Some proto amara words that are likely cognates differ purely based on these initial consonants, and this sound change is not consistent in all cases, likely due to efforts to reduce the incidence of homophones, such as with haku and waku. Aymara has also influenced Spanish in the local area. Politeness is very important in Aymara, with great morphological emphasis on the expression of politeness. It makes use of many derivational and inflectional suffixes to mark politeness, and this abundance of politeness markers has affected the local native Spanish speakers. In La Paz Spanish, the following particles are often used to soften or attenuate sentences, which is a notable difference from standard Spanish. Furthermore, the Spanish spoken in the Andes retains the sound yet, that has been mostly lost in the Spanish spoken in the rest of the continent due to merging with Y. This could potentially be due to the fact that Aymara or other Andean languages like Jacara and Quechua has phonemic look. The language contact between Spanish and Aymara may have preserved the sound. As for synchronic studies, the earliest synchronic studies of Aymara were conducted after the era was conquered when various Christian orders came to convert the Incas. The first Aymara grammar was made in 1603 by a Jesuit called Ludovico Bertonio. His grammar was very well done for the era as he did not try to force it to fit Latin grammar as was often the case. Thousands of Catholic and secular texts were created for the Aymara people, making the language well documented. Many of the suffixes that were recorded in the first descriptions of Aymara are still used nowadays, whereas some are only used in specific dialects or Aymara sister languages. However, the Aymara recorded in early texts is not the kind that would be spoken by native speakers, as it is largely just directly translated from Spanish to its detriment. It is awkward and unnatural. Bertonius' grammar, in particular, clarifies that it is based on translated religious texts. Due to the heavy religious influence in early recordings of Aymara, this form has been called missionary Aymara by native speakers. Another problematic aspect of Aymara's grammars was the emphasis on Spanish. Achieving literacy in Aymara was framed as being the first step in learning Spanish literacy, rather than Aymara itself being the goal. This is emphasised by grammars having instructions such as following good Spanish grammar or observing the style of Spanish writers. Aymara was originally mistakenly described as having five vowels, based on those found in Spanish. This remained the case until 1947, when Bertil Malmberg wrote that there were, in fact, three vowels in Aymara's phonemic system. Another important aspect of Aymara is that mutuality is seen as more important than individuality, which was first recorded by an anthropologist named John T. Cole. This is an aspect of Aymara culture that is reflected in the language, particularly in the person system. Aymara has a four person system involving a speaker, a dressy, non locutor, and inclusive, the latter of which consists of the speaker and the dressy together. The presence of the inclusive person highlights the importance of mutuality within the language, as well as the fact that the dressy is emphasized by being overmarked in verbs. Today, Aymara can still be seen in both written, audio, and visual forms. Unfortunately, many speakers do not have literacy skills in Aymara, so perhaps because of this, radio is by far the most popular form of Aymara language media, and has been since the 80s and 90s. There are also cases of Aymara on television, such as on TV Peru, the national television channel in Peru, where a news programme in Aymara called Chiba Sanaka plays at 5am every weekday. There have been attempts to improve literacy, such as having triangular sections of newspapers with news written in Spanish, Aymara and Quechua, mainly to boost literacy in the latter two languages. 
Furthermore, while traditionally not encouraged or enforced, in the past few decades, there have been growing numbers of schools offering classes in Amara, thanks to a number of campaigns to revitalize and maintain the language. That's all I have for this presentation. So I hope it was informative and that you learned something new about Amara. So thank you for watching and juice pagara, as they would say in Amara. <laughs>